for today's class on acute liver failure. Today's faculty is Dr. Suresh Ramasubban. He is the senior consultant in pulmonary critical care medicine in Apollo, Apollo Multispeciality Hospitals, Calcutta. And his area of interest is mechanical ventilation. As I was mentioning, so the objective of this talk is uh, going to be manifold. Uh, the etiology, as we are talking about, differs from country to country. So it depends on where you are giving the exams and what is this. But the management remain the same. Of course, the management of the underlying cause will also vary depending on the etiology. Uh, the treatment of complications, especially the hepatic encephalopathy and cerebral edema, which we'll focus on. And the, the need for what we talk about is, when we talk about acute liver failure, is the, what are the referrals? When do you refer? And what is the indication for liver transplantation? You don't need to know the nitty gritty of how a transplant works. Yes, you need to know uh, whether it's um, uh, allograft and what kind of an allograft you're giving. Is there any role for xenografting and so on and so forth. So let's get started and uh, talk about various issues that are pertaining to uh, the uh, acute liver failure and then we'll take it from there. All right, so it is an uh, background is that uh, the time, basically it's a clinical sequelae for an acute liver injury without any background liver disease. So that means it's not somebody who's got a chronic liver disease who's now has a worsening of his liver function. It is somebody who had pre-existently a normal liver and suddenly goes, uh, the liver starts failing. And this is associated, we know, as a very high mortality of almost 50 to 75 percent. I would say in our country, uh, when you have acute liver failure, uh, it's uh, beyond 75 percent most of the times. Uh, so the encephalopathy, which is subsequent to the beginning of the liver injury, which is manifested by the ictus or jaundice, is the usual presentation. So that means you have a person who presents with jaundice, which is very regular in a physician practice or a GP practice to all of us. So many of our patients present with jaundice to our chambers and uh, to the hospital, and we're not worried about it. But it is the jaundice which progresses to encephalopathy and with an abnormal INR ratio of INR greater than 1.5. And this entity is what is an acute liver failure. So the progression and this, if it happens within 24 weeks, is what is called as an acute liver failure. And that's the definition that we are looking for. Uh, so this progression from jaundice to altered mental status associated with the coagulopathy is acute. Liver. So that's the a definition that we are talking about or that's what is happening. And so as a result of which, the clinical presentation includes basically liver dysfunction. So you will have abnormal liver chemical values, coagulopathy, encephalopathy, and then subsequently multi-hemodynamic instability, respiratory failure, multi-organ failure will set in. And death occurs, in, as I said, in up to half or in our country, almost up to three-fourths of the cases. Uh, this is very important that sometimes when people present with altered mental status, a lot of times in ICU, people don't present with jaundice followed by the classical uh, altered mental status and coagulopathy. People come to us from an ICU, to an ICU uh, as a referral from some rural area or from some other place, patient has not paid this, comes in with altered mental status. And then at that time, the encephalopathy is the presenting diagnosis and the representing symptom. And we don't have this classical uh, pre -ex a little bit of jaundice two to three weeks ago, which started and now worsening and then associated with men. So that, that situation, the clinical presentation is very difficult. And then because, uh, uh, especially in, also it becomes difficult in hyperacute cases in which jaundice is minimal or in subacute cases, that means six weeks or so, where the it may be mistaken for a chronic liver disease based on the albumin value and so on and so forth. So what will happen is that the clinical presentation of this history of a icterus followed by an altered mental status and associated coagulopathy within a time frame of six months is what is important to make a diagnosis of uh, acute liver failure. So when you look at the manifestation, you can because acute liver failure, because liver, when any organ fails, whether it's acute kidney injury, you can have manifestation in every organ. Uh, so it, this is uh, so one of the differentials of somebody who comes in with a multi-organ failure is acute liver failure. It's obviously the differential. So this is going to be a multi-organ failure that happens when the liver fails. So because you're going to have two organs which is gone. The liver is gone. So you have loss of metabolic function. So you have decreased gluconeogenesis. So you manifest as hypoglycemia. You have poor lactate clearance manifesting as lactic acidosis. You have poor ammonia clearance manifesting as hyperammonemia. You have decreased synthetic capacity leading to coagulopathy. 
and the altered mental status which subsequently follows is because of hepatic encephalopathy or cerebral edema or sometimes even intracranial hypertension. So that's the second organ which is gone. Very rarely you would see a subclinical myocardial injury and a high output state is common, but you'll commonly see an ARDS like picture on acute lung injury picture. You would frequently see a, a suppression of the bone marrow. You would frequently see AKI. You would be uh, not very uncommon to see pancreatitis, especially in acetaminophen related disease. Uh, you can have portal hypertension in a subacute disease, and this will lead to the confusion of chronic liver disease that we just mentioned. You will have an impaired function of the leukocytes. Immunoparesis will happen, which makes them very prone to sepsis. So when these patients come in to the ICU, they have been admitted to the ward. It's very difficult to distinguish the hemodynamic instability and the poor lactates, whether it's because of sepsis or because of acute liver failure. So acute liver failure is a uh, one of the mimics of sepsis, which we have to be aware of. So sepsis and sepsis vice versa can be presenting with a similar multi-organ failure, but the the synthetic capacity and the loss of metabolic function and the amount of job, bilirubin is never above five. That's what is the classical teaching in case of sepsis while an acute liver failure it will invariably be above five gram, milligram per deciliter. So that's some of, some of the ways in which we look at it. And this, this is basically what it tells you is that a clinical and acute liver failure classically is the liver dysfunction and the brain dysfunction and the coagulopathy that is happening. The remaining may or may not be there, but if you have greater than or equal to two organ failure, that's by definition a multi-organ failure. So in this situation, an ALF will is one of the differentials of a multi-organ failure is acute liver failure. So in your edic vignette, case vignettes, the presentation will be of a multi-organ system and it will be very obvious that this is an Tylenol talk acetaminophen toxicity, and you'll know that this is a paracetamol poisoning. But what they will first question is always asked is what's the differential diagnosis? And we are expecting you to give one mark each for the, uh, the answers that you give for the uh, various differential diagnosis. So the differential diagnosis of this kind of presentation is a differential diagnosis of any cause of multi-organ failure. So you can all right been saying that this could be sepsis, this could be decompensated heart failure and so on and so forth. This could be toxins, this could be, you know, uh, any other cause of the, as we said, a catastrophic apla, any of these things, uh, lupus, will all present with multi-organ failure and you will have all these things. But the predominant way in we identify liver failure in clinical feature is the onset of jaundice followed by onset of altered mental status, which is happening in a kind of a period of time, not like one day or two days, which is what normally happens in sepsis and other things. So this is how you, <clears throat> you are capable, you are to recognize acute liver failure in a clinical scenario that is given to you and offer a differential diagnosis. So, uh, and then we also appreciate uh, if you can able to identify what is the, uh, when you have hepatic encephalopathy to grade it, <clears throat> because the prognosis of hepatic encephalopathy in acute liver failure, the prognosis of acute liver failure, the need for transplantation, the Chances of spontaneous recovery depends on your initial grading of the presentation of hepatic encephalopathy. So if you have a patient who is euphoric or depressed, who's mildly confused, who's got a slight slurred speech and some disorder of sleep, uh, and has got may or may not have an asterisk and the EEG is usually normal, we'll call it as a grade one hepatic encephalopathy. When you're lethargic and moderate confusion and with asterisks, you will call be called a grade two. Marked confusion, incoherent speech, sleeping but arousable is uh, grade three and grade four would be coma where you need not have asterisks again. So somebody who's comatose with a background of acute liver failure, uh, you need not be able, will not be able to elicit asterisks to see. So no asterisks will not be there. And the easy definitely will be grossly abnormal with an encephalopathic pattern. So this is how you grade it. And because grade stage grade three and four, and the chances of spontaneous recovery is very less, so the referral for a liver transplant should be early. And that's what we expect in the exam in the VIVAS. When you see this, and you should be able to look at the clinical scenario. I will give you a clinical scenario in the end of this lecture. And you should be able to say that, yes, this is stage three, grade three, and hepatic encephalopathy, as a result of which this is really serious. Or is this grade one or two? I can still manage it in a low level center. I don't need to refer to a liver transplant center. So those are the questions that will be arising as we, or will be answering as we go along this lecture. All right, so the definition. So we have looked at what is the, the time, what we say is the 
interval between the onset of symptoms of liver dysfunction and the development of encephalopathy. This IEI, this is the interval between onset of encephalopathy and ictus, IEI, is an important uh, concept because this will recognize different disease phenotypes. So if you are within 7 to 10 days, it's generally toxins like this, and it can remove a relatively large amount of copper and will temporarily buy you time. And there is no role for chelation therapy in the management of acute liver failure due to Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease earlier on, you might have role for chelation, but when somebody is acutely ill with an acute liver failure in your ICU, plasma exchange with fresh protein plasma is the way to go forward for treatment of uh, Wilson's disease. Um, uh, for autoimmune hepatitis, uh, it's not very clear whether administering glucocorticoids can prevent the need for liver transplantation. Uh, there is uh, concern over septic complications in patients receiving glucocorticoids. But for people who have an INR, which is more than 1.5, but without hepatic glucoencephalopathy, it's okay to give a trial of glucocorticoids while performing a transplant evaluation and closely monitoring their merit score. Uh, and uh, reserving liver transplantation for patients who will develop encephalopathy. So, autoimmune, again, these are the domain of the hepatologist. Uh, we may have some background knowledge, but the decision to initiate therapy or not is generally left to the liver specialist to help us with and to help us in treating. But yes, we need to be aware that yes, there is a role for 40 to 60 milligram of prednisone per day for two weeks or even lesser for in case of autoimmune hepatitis. We need to be very much aware that for acute fatty liver of pregnancy, uh, there is no specific medical treatment. So delivery of the fetus should be prompt. And once the mother has been, once the mother has been stabilized, we should deliver the fetus and that's the treatment. And within seven, Subsequently, within 72 to 96 hours, the liver function will start being restored to normal. Uh, for idiopathic cause, again, as we said, NAC is a reasonable option when we don't know what is the cause. So please feel free to use NAC in both acetam and the paracetamol poisoning as well as the cause is clearly unknown. So this is about the specific cause treatment. Uh, we talked about general management. We talked about treatment of the particular etiological cause and then we talk about the most important thing in which the intensive care people are involved that is the management of complications so what are the various complications that we talk about we talk metabolic complications we about the hepatic encephalopathy which is the the core topic cerebral edema which is more important in acute liver failure and as and um, as because hepatic encephalopathy is much more common in CLD, we talk about how to manage seizures, AKI, and the various pulmonary complications that can happen. So let's go one by one. And the metabolic complications, the metabolic abnormalities are the acid-base abnormalities, the electrolyte abnormalities, and hypoglycemia, which is what we are going to be concerned about. So amongst the acid-base disorder. You know, alkalosis is more common than acidosis in the early stages of acute liver failure. You can get an addict question with an ABG, which will show respiratory alkalosis in the background of acute liver failure. And you should be able to say that there is a mixed respiratory and metabolic abnormality, um, which is there. And especially in salicylate, uh, uh, especially with uh, toxins, you will see this respiratory alkalosis is very common. Uh, metabolic alkalosis also is important to recognize because it contributes to hepatic encephalopathy by facilitating ammonia entry into the brain by promoting the conversion of ammonia, ammonium to a, uh, which is a charged particle that cannot cross the blood-brain barrier into ammonia which can cross the blood-brain barrier. So having metabolic alkalosis, so being contracted, so that's why it's important to hydrate them and being able to recognize that there's a metabolic and respiratory alkalosis and tackling the metabolic alkalosis is very important so as to prevent the development of encephalopathy. As the acute liver failure progresses, patient will start developing metabolic acidosis and that's predominantly due to lactic acidosis with respiratory alkalosis. So in your ABG, you can get a combination of mixed acid-based disorders in the bag in an AL in an acute liver failure case. So you should be able to pick up the fact that this could be alkalosis, both metabolic and respiratory alkalosis. The commonest cause of respiratory alkalosis is gram-negative sepsis and uh, things like that, but uh, salicylate poisoning and but liver failure, acute liver failure is also something which you should remember as one of the three causes of uh, acute respiratory alkalosis. All right. Um, again, as I said, uh, metabolic acidosis will develop as you patients get worse and sick and they're getting either septic or they're getting into tissue hypoperfusion or they're not able to clear the lactate because of the liver failure. The electrolyte abnormalities, the question will go as three electrolyte abnormalities, which are important. 
hypokalemia, hyponatremia, and hypophosphatemia. These are the three ones which are important. Hypokalemia is the most important one. It is common in both fulminant and subfulminant hepatic failure. And various factors like diuretic therapy, but most important is an increased sympathetic tone uh, since activation of the beta-2 adrenergic receptors promote the uptake of potassium by the cells. So the sympathetic tone causes the beta-2 adrenergic receptors to be activated in potassium to go into the cells and the serum potassium levels to fall. The significant important thing is that uh, hypokalemia increases renal ammonia production and hypokalemia should be corrected if present. This question is always, always asked and I uh, always like to ask is that if you have a patient with hepatic encephalopathy, what is your priority number one? The priority, and if you have hepatic encephalopathy and hypokalemia, the priority number one is to keep the potassium levels normal first. And then the priority is to give your lactulose and other things in chronic liver disease. So in patients with uh, hypokalemia with acute liver failure, again, the same principle applies. So correct potassium first, first, first before you go on to do anything else. Again, hyponatremia is very much more common in subacute and chronic liver disease. Again, tissue hypoperfusion leads to an SIADH kind of syndrome. And again, hyponatremia should be treated, but again, you have to be sure, careful to not to prevent osmotic demyelination syndrome that can happen with rapid, overly rapid correction. So hyponatremia is uh, very, very common, especially when you have a subacute hepatic failure. Hypophosphatemia is also especially common, especially it's a diagnostic clue to acetaminophen induced acute liver failure and those with intact renal function. So the presence of hypophosphatemia is actually a good prognostic sign. And the fall in plasma phosphate is due to the movement into the cells and maybe because there is a metabolic or synthetic demands of a regenerating liver. So most patients with hypophosphatemia are asymptomatic and treatment is usually not required. But uh, the presence of a low phosphate level should be monitored and it should be treated because the, if the lack of phosphate will lead to respiratory failure and arrest. So that's something which we need to be aware of. The fourth one is the hypoglycemia. 40% of patients with acute liver failure will have depletion of the glycogen stores and impaired gluconeogenesis and this will lead to an increased mortality. And the plasma glucose monitoring, glucose should be monitored carefully and sugar should be kept above, I would say above 70, though the guidelines are saying 65, but uh, you can, I think, quote that as 70 milligram. 70 milligram per deciliter is what you need to keep it above at all times. Uh, the second complication, the good idea as to what's happening, this is just one I'm going to do and then I'm going to stop because that's speaking for more than an hour, I'm not also used to. I hope I gave you a flavor of what's happening and we can always uh, share certain questions later on. All right, so this is somebody who's been admitted for confusion and jaundice of six weeks duration. Medical history is unremarkable. So majority of you, when you're presented with this, and the case vignettes in EDIC2 would be, what is this? And you can look at this and say, INR 2.6, AST, ALT high, bilirubin is 18, creatinine is three, and his vital status is confused. So he's got a, a grade one to two encephalopathy and he's got a jaundice uh, and is a crest to encephalopathy time is less than six weeks of duration. So this is a fulminant hepatic failure. His ultrasound is normal. He doesn't have any dilated uh, hepatic uh, portal or anything. So the question would be, what would be, would you doing in this uh, patient and would which one be true or false? So for instance, transfusion of FFP is required in this patient and the answer is no. You transfuse only when uh, uh, you are bleeding, you don't, there's no role for prophylactic transfusion because you want to use the INR as a um, prognostic marker, as a marker of whether the lung liver is getting better or not. Uh, intermittent hemodialysis is better tolerated than liver failure and the answer is no. Continuous renal replacement is better tolerated in liver failure. Uh, referral for liver transplant should be done in this patient and the answer is yes. Every setting, uh, when you see an acute liver failure, you should and diagnosis of acute liver failure is obviously correct in this situation. So that's all. I, I tried to cover everything because in a vignette, trying to make questions, I would have realized I would have made overshot by about a couple of hours. So I'm going to stop just by giving you one more slide only from an Indian perspective. This is not from an EDIC perspective. Please remember these diagnoses as a differential diagnosis of ALF in the, our part of the world, severe malaria, dengue, lepto, and scuff virus, and the various treatment for that. All right. Thank you very much for your kind attention to whoever is there. Great. So, Dr. Ramasubhan, that's it for today. To our participants, we'll see you all on the next class. Thank you all very much.